this is not a new problem in Baltimore, that it is in fact a centuries old problem, and that decades upon decades of uh, divestment, systematic, physical, and economic assault on black communities in Baltimore um, has been endured by these communities, and that what is being seen on the streets in policy in the kinds of alliances that are being built are the results of a long history of structural racism and how it has played out in individual communities in Baltimore. I think what is uh, particularly hopeful, I'm hopeful actually, um, in seeing the uprising that is happening in Baltimore and throughout the country is as we think about and lots of folks have framed whether this is a moment or a movement, that this is in fact a movement. And that what we are seeing on the ground in Baltimore is a real uh, connection to the values of democratic control, community-led efforts, and the space for a community to build new alliances. Uh, one of the pieces that I've been uh, most impressed with in the media thus far has been a, a local media piece in which rival gangs in this community have come together to say enough is enough. And if those kinds of alliances are focused on and we're thinking about what does it take to really build uh, from the grassroots, it takes those kinds of relationships. And in Baltimore, we're seeing the forging of coalitions of organizations that have worked together before but are working together in a new way. Um, we have seen that many of the protests have been organized by a coalition called uh, Baltimore United for Change, and they are in large part youth-led, youth-led organizations, black youth-led organizations that are saying we not only understand what the problem is and we have offered in the past solutions but we will demand that these solutions take effect and that we are in leadership in doing that. I think that that uh, ethos that is being created uh, and amplified in the midst of the uprising is extremely hopeful. And it's the basis for really thinking about the, the economic solidarity that we're talking about specifically today. That in communities that previously were not as connected, organizations that previously were not as uh, engaged with one another, that those relationships are the core of the kind of collaboration and cooperation that we're talking about, and we're seeing them um, foster and grow in this uprising. In addition, to what is happening in the midst of the uprising, there were already a range of organizations um, that have been doing good work in their communities for a very long time around cooperative economics. Um, from very uh, publicly, folks have, have now uh, learned about uh, Curtis Bay and the incinerator fight and the way in which that community has galvanized and is thinking very deliberately about uh, community solar and the ways in which lots of communities are thinking about uh, food justice in a very deliberate way um, and creating, growing their own community gardens, sharing that food, creating jobs for young people in the community through those projects, um, as well as a very robust uh, conversation around community land trusts. Um, and an emerging discussion around black worker centers. That as the discussion began, that there isn't, I think uh, Bill stated, there's no silver bullet. We're very clear about that. And that it will take multiple solutions in order to address uh, the centuries of structural racism that are evidenced today and that those solutions will come in many forms, um, that worker cooperatives are essential and very much a part of what is being discussed as uh, emerging uh, new economy, solidarity economy uh, framework in Baltimore, 
it is also important that we're talking about worker-led organizing, youth-led advocacy, and that those are core elements to a solution as well. So I will stop there. I could go on for a while, so I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Sir.